Uh, let me just first start by expressing my gratitude um, to all of you who are here um, tonight uh, tuning in and listening to my research as well as um, my thanks and gratitude to the entire staff at Linda Hall Library. Uh, it was such an honor to be a research fellow back in 2018 um, to be able to access the library's wonderful resources and to take part um, in what was a very engaging intellectual community. Uh, since my time at Linda Hall Library, I've been doing a lot of research um, in Washington, D.C. at the National Archives, as well as uh, in Bolivia and Brazil on a Fulbright Haze. Since returning, uh, I have been writing up a storm, um, and tonight I have the great opportunity, the honor, um, to present just a slice of that research with you. Okay, so... I would not um, fault you at all if you looked at this image and you were a bit confused. This is certainly not most people's idea of what Bolivia looks like. Um, the images that more commonly come to mind uh, would be the towering snow-capped mountains of the Andes, colorful marketplaces, perhaps the salt flats of Uyuni or the tin mines. Um, but surely enough, this photo um, is the Bolivia that is less well known, uh, that of Bolivia's lowlands. Um, and in point to fact, uh, the lowlands actually cover two thirds of the entire national territory, stretching from the Amazon rainforest in the north to the Gran Chaco region of the south. Um, this photo that we're looking at is a recent aerial photo of the city of Santa Cruz de la Sierra, which is the capital city of the department of Santa Cruz. Um, today, this city has 2.3 million people. That makes it the largest city um, in Bolivia, larger than the Boliv Bolivia's capital city of La Paz, which within in its entire metropolitan area only has 1.8 million. So today, Santa Cruz is really undeniably the country's demographic and economic powerhouse. This hasn't been always the case. Santa Cruz has experienced exponential growth as compared to the rest of Bolivia, but also as compared to the rest of South America. That growth was largely in part uh, to, due to the department's petroleum and its agriculture, specifically soy, also sugar, cotton, rice. Um, but economic growth was also the product of intense investment in the region by both Bolivia and the United States. A U.S.-Bolivian partnership in this region's development began in the early 1940s. That U.S. aid um, would only expand over the years. Uh, and by 1964, Bolivia was actually the second highest per capita recipient of U.S. aid in the world. But today I'm talking about a different era, um, an era in which the U.S. first became involved in aid and technical assistance, um, the 1940s. And the Santa Cruz of the 1940s looked a whole lot different than Santa Cruz of today. In the 1940s, the entire department had just 200,000 people. So that's, that was 1.4 people per square mile. The capital city was little more than 16 square blocks. Uh, largely unpaved, lacking in basic amenities like electricity and running water. Uh, one visiting U.S. official actually noted that in all of his travels around the world, only China was dirtier and less sanitary uh, than Santa Cruz. Roads that connected it to other regions were simple ox cart trails um, that often were rendered impassable during what is a long rainy season. In this lecture, I'm going to discuss why Santa Cruz became so important to visions of the country's future in that era, both for Bolivian nationalists and for the U.S. State Department. Despite U.S. wartime interests in procuring tin from Highland mines, the U.S. focused its financial resources on constructing a road that would reach what, at this point, was a veritable backwater. The road in question was, according to the New York Times, the most important road in Bolivia, the one the whole populace talks about to strangers, one surveyed but never built. It was the road that would finally connect Bolivia's highlands 
cities like La Paz, which stand at 12,000 feet above sea level, to its lowlands at approximately 1,000 feet above sea, sea level. It was a missing link in a much larger network of rail that cut across the continent, um, the waistline of the continent, from Santos, the Brazilian port of Santos, to the Chilean port of Arica, which you can see on this map. Um, that missing link, this row that we'll be talking about from Cochabamba to Santa Cruz, is that white section at the heart of Bolivia uh, on the map. Once I've given an overview of the geographic and regional diversity in the country, as well as the crises of the 1930s that ultimately led Bolivia to focus and pin its hopes on lowland development, I will de delve into uh, the main conflict that arose between the US and Bolivian partnership in constructing this road. Namely, whether that road would be a railway or a highway. And that might seemingly uh, be an easy question that could be resolved dispassionately. Um, that would not necessarily be the case. Uh, a US-backed highway came to represent for many Bolivians the limits of their sovereignty, um, the limits of their ability to enact the type of future they wanted for their country. I'm going to take a moment to just pause um, because current politics in Bolivia are um, forefront of mind. Um, so, and to, to take the opportunity to note some of the resonance of my work in the context of these times, um, specifically the presidential ele election, uh, which happened yesterday. The road we're discussing today was part of an effort to diminish regionalism finally unifying the country. But 80 years after the road was constructed, what we've seen is only the entrenchment of regionalism in, in departments like Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz today is the most important site of resistance um, to the party uh, that up until last year has ruled the country for the past 14 years. Uh, that is MAS, or the movement towards socialism. Um, in 2005, Evo Morales, the country's first indigenous president, a man of Aymada descent, um, was elected president. And ever since then, Santa Cruz has served um, as an important pole of opposition. More recently, last October, the results of the presidential election showed that MAS had won again, um, which would have meant Evo Morales' fourth term in office but widespread protest um, that started in Santa Cruz lasted for uh, several weeks, 21 days, spreading across the country is ultimately what led to Morales' resignation um, and his time in exile. In his stead, an unelected right-wing interim government took power, brutally repressing mass supporters, um, and continually punting democratic elections further down the road, uh, purportedly due to COVID-19. But just yesterday, what it, uh, in what is undeniably a historic moment in Bolivian history, Bolivians cast their vote. Um, and while the official vote count is not fully in, it seems very clear that MAS has won in a landslide victory. Of course, um, there's still a lot of unknowns um, and there's much concern about whether these results will be respected, especially in areas like Santa Cruz. And what we've seen in Santa Cruz is something we've seen many times um, over its history. The strong regionalism that fueled calls for secession on, and often was based in claims of ethnic and racial difference. White Crusanos against the Highland indigenous represented by Morales. At stake in Santa Cruz was, has always also been about the control over resource wealth, namely the department's petroleum. Um, natural gas from the department is really what has made possible Bolivia's economic growth under Morales and also funded um, their expansive social programs. But importantly, in the 1940s, Santa Cruz really represented a different type of possibility. Uh, for Bolivian nationalists of the era. It was a frontier through which national unity might be forged. 
Proposed roads that connected lowland highland Bolivia would serve as the country's backbone, finally bringing the country together, stitching together diverse regions, their economies, and their peoples into one organic whole. If there is one defining characteristic of Bolivia, it is its immense diversity. Uh, in the map that you see to the left shows the country's physiographic diversity from arid Altiplano, 13,000 feet above sea level in the west, dropping down to the Intermountain Valley region in the eastern lowlands stretching to the east. But when we talk diversity, we're not solely talking geography. On the right, you can see some of the results from the 1900 census, which by 1940 was the last census taken. You have a country that is nearly half indigenous. Uh, you have a very small and insular population uh, ruling elite that is considered white. And you have 30%, a third of the population that is mestizo, um, the word that is used to describe people of mixed European and indigenous descent. But this snapshot is vastly inadequate to really capture that diversity. Uh, each region has its own very particular um, demographics and conditions. For example, the Department of Santa Cruz claimed proportionately to have the largest percentage of whites in the country. Moreover, Indian is here used as an umbrella term. Uh, Bolivia today recognizes 36 indigenous nations, each with their own language. The most common are Aymara, Quechua, and Guarani. Um, and those can be very broadly mapped onto the geographic features of the country. Aymara of the highlands uh, in, the, in Western Bolivia, Quechua of the Intermountain Valley regions, um, such as Center Ground Cochabamba, and the Guarani of the lowlands. There was a sense in Bolivia that nature completely dictated the country's social, political, and economic makeup and would continue to dictate the country's future. Bolivians refer to regional cleavages as a true tragedy of geography. So as you enter the 1940s, you have a country that is seemingly insurmountable regional and ethnic differences reinforced by geographic obstacles. In the 1930s, those issue, issues would become so much more visible. Of course, the stock markets crashed in 1929. Uh, the price of tin fell dramatically and pulled the entire rug out from underneath Bolivia's economy, since its economy rested very precariously um, and solely on tin exports. In the midst of this fallout, Bolivia entered into a prolonged and disastrous war that it fought against Paraguay over the contested Chaco region, um, which if you are looking at this map in front of you is the region um, in the country's southeast. They would fight this war from 1932 to 1935. In Bolivia alone, this war meant 60,000 dead. We're speaking of more dead per capita than in Europe during World War I. The vast majority of casualties were not the result of direct warfare. They were the result of thirst, hunger, and disease, which is to say, they were the result of inadequate supply lines and weak infrastructure. The war brought thousands of troops from all over the country to the lowlands, often for the very first time, to fight alongside troops who did not resemble them and did not necessarily speak the same language. The loss of territory to Paraguay was one in a long line of territorial losses that Bolivia experienced in just recent history. You can see all of those losses in this map here. From 1900 to 1938, Bolivia lost 50% of its total territory, um, just under 300,000 square miles. So despite utter failure in the Chaco campaign, the one shred, there was one shred of success, um, which was the defense of Santa Cruz de la Sierra and Bolivia's petroleum. Returning troops were hailed as the defenders of the petroleum. 
But war definitively brought the country's attention to Santa Cruz and its petroleum um, as something that had to be harnessed and had to be hitched to the rest of the country. So this crisis would actually bring a heady period of social analysis and ideological ferment. It was this era that would be the foundation for radical change um, that was brought in the 1952 revolution. Um, among other things, um, the revolution brought nationalization of the big three mines, universal suffrage, and land reform. But in this post chaco war era, socialism really was becoming the word of the day. Uh, and a series of military socialist regimes led by young disgruntled officers came to power during this era. They saw Santa Cruz and its petroleum as the key to the country's redemption and regeneration. So both of these images up on this slide are actually from um, the local museum of history in Santa Cruz. The painting up on the top is hanging on the walls of that museum. Um, it has one of the presidents of this era, Hermann Busch, um, and you see the troops heading off into battle, protecting the petroleum, going into the fire um, and disaster of the Chaco War, only to come out on the other side, reborn in the form of a railway um, that would lead to progress for the Eastern lowlands. Unlike other raw materials, oil held out a unique promise for Latin American countries. If used as an energy source for domestic industry, it had the potential to, to break Latin American dependency on the export of raw materials, which in the case of Bolivia meant tin. And in 1937, something truly remarkable happened in Santa Cruz, an event that had hemispheric repercussions. That was the expropriation of Standard Oil Company's property in the department. This was the very first oil nationalization in the Western Hemisphere. And it really can't be overstated. This was nothing short of extraordinary. Bolivia took on one of the most powerful companies in the world, knowingly jeopardized their relationship with the United States, the primary market for Bolivian tin. They did this despite being one of the hemisphere's poorest countries. It truly was resource sovereignty or bust. And uh, in the post Chaco war period, that was an incredibly powerful and unifying banner. To the shock and dismay of, of the US State Department, uh, this would be the first of many nationalizations across the region. Um, but it was here in Santa Cruz that it happened first. In both photos, the railway features prominently. Um, and in the journal, cover to the left, which was a journal that was published in Santa Cruz in the late 1930s and 40s. Uh, you have this beautiful, fully mature woman who represented a sleeping Santa Cruz just waiting for the railway to arrive, uh, to awaken her, ready for her full participation um, in the country's development. And it should also be noted uh, with this journal cover that these visions also carried with them a racial project one of forging new mestizo Bolivian citizens who physically could unify the country. Road and rail networks to and through the lowlands were seen as a patriotic undertaking to extend the state's territorial control, integrate the nation state, and harness diverse resource wealth for national prosperity. Lowland oil would industrialize Bolivia, while lowland agriculture would feed the country. It was a vision of self-sufficiency. And this would be a complete break with a past that had been dictated by export-oriented mining. A sector that had exhausted the wealth of the highlands, both human and mineral, for foreign profit. Uh, with lowland petroleum and agriculture, they might just be able to diversify the economy, integrate the country, all guided by a strong interventionist state. In an oft-repeated sentiment, one Bolivian senator noted, the railway represents the effective connection of the two major geographic zones of our territory. That is the mountains, which represent our past, our history, and the plains, which are our future. They will, he argued, give us our nationality, the coherence that geography denied us. And all of these visions were pinned on one particular project, 
the construction of the Cochabamba Santa Cruz Railway, that missing link. So these are all photos from another railway um, that was built during the 1940s um, from the border of Brazil um, to that connected to the city of Santa Cruz de la Sierra. <clears throat> and they represent the kind of progress the railway was supposed to usher in. Transportation and state services like hospitals, which you see on the right, and schools that were widely accessible, services that would help encourage people to settle the country's far-flung interior. For Bolivian nationalists of the era, it was simple common sense that if any technology was poised to overcome the obstacles of nature, it had to be the railroad. In part, this belief was a product of history. Bolivia's rail network that had been completed in the early 20th century had served only to connect mining centers outwards to Pacific ports. These railways had actually weakened the connections, the commercial relations between and among Bolivian regions. Railway cars now returned to mining centers full of cheap agricultural imports, decimating lowland, um, the market for lowland agriculture. They fueled resentment towards the central government um, and strengthened a belief that the government had abandoned the lowlands. If the railway was what had disarticulated the nation, it had to be a railway uh, that would serve to reintegrate it. Further, the railway had a certain desired power of spectacle, <clears throat> expanding both the perception and the reality of the state's presence in far-flung regions. Railway construction also meant the actual construction of worker housing, hospitals, schools, could be a source of long-term, well-respected professional careers and career ladders. And by this time, Bolivians had already garnered substantial expertise in railroads. The railway union was arguably one of the strongest uh, unions in the country at that time. The railway and its services could be made widely accessible. A state-run railway could subsidize rates to encourage commerce and production, could offer pre free passage uh, to potential settlers, even if that meant running it at a loss. They also saw it as a good that could be held or sold, depending on the state's needs. And most importantly, Bolivians saw the railway as the only technology that would spur and incentivize people to settle. Each station, a nucleus around which new populations could flourish. The railway would facilitate ongoing circulation of these people and their products along the line, um, forging what uh, many called a blood connection. It also must be remembered, though, that these visions of change were not confined to the domestic. They were part of a vision for South America um, that had the Department of Santa Cruz and its petroleum smack dab in the center. A larger interoceanic railway, um, according to Vasquez Machicado, who is a Cruceño intellectual, and Cruceño refers to people from Santa Cruz, um, represents, as he said, for the Southern Hemisphere, what the Panama Canal represents for the blonde refuge of the North. In the late 1930s, directly after nationalization, Bolivia signed treaties with its neighbor, its neighbors, uh, exchanging petroleum for international railway lines. With the enticement of newly nationalized oil, they sought to strengthen commercial relations uh, and secure South American funding to pursue internal development. But the railway would also serve, uh, they said, as a new axis. Rather than a Pan-America that stretched north to south with the United States safely at the helm, Bolivian diplomats promoted this new east-west axis as finally integrating South America as a region, as a block. Uh, the railway would create a South American market for South American products, all stimulating uh, the region's industrialization. So while Bolivian diplomats were able to convince countries like Brazil and Argentina to finance international railways that would link those countries' borders with Bolivia's oil-rich region of Santa Cruz, the much more difficult task was securing the funding uh, for the link that connected Bolivia only to itself, the highlands to the lowlands. 
entered the United States. The extension of US aid in 1941 would be the beginning of a long-standing US-Bolivian partnership in development efforts. Um, and I should just note that these photos up on your, your screen are photos from a USIS publication of the 1950s and were part of a competition um, for Bolivians to paint the relationship um, between the US and Bolivia. Uh, in both of these images, you can see that Lady Liberty features heavily. It's harder to see on the image to the left, but she's standing next to the airplane. Um, and she's shining a light onto Bolivia, unveiling labor and productivity. Um, in the image to the left, you have an indigenous couple in traditional garb, uh, holding old traditional tools, um, who are being left behind um, as the new machines, the tractors, the railway, the airplanes forge ahead. U.S. interest in Santa Cruz began in the aftermath of nationalization. The department seemed to be ground zero for regional trends of resource nationalism and anti-Americanism. Three months after nationalization, the State Department, the U.S. State Department, sent Economic Affairs Specialist Merwin Bowen to report on opportunities for U.S. economic assistance. Bowen would later write a report that would be credited as the roadmap for the country's development well through the 1950s. Uh, and I should note that during my time in Kansas City, I was actually able to access uh, his papers, which are held at the Truman Library. In his reports, Bowen expressed bewilderment by squandered opportunity in Santa Cruz and promoted the idea that the department should serve as the country's breadbasket. Support for lowland agriculture might actually, he argued, benefit the U.S. commercially. If Bolivia were to become self-sufficient in food, the country would no longer need to expend so much of its foreign exchange on food imports. That would free up money to be able to pay back U.S. loans and increase spending on manufactured goods. He estimated that Bolivia would be able to double those purchases. And if it did, the U.S. stood to gain. 78% of all U.S. goods imported to Bolivia were manufactured products like cars, trucks, machinery, and tools. And moreover, if development was successful, the region would be a new and enlarged market for U.S. goods. Who stood to lose? The countries who provided Bolivia with food up until that point, um, namely its South American neighbors, specifically Chile, Argentina, uh, and Peru. Bowen's plan would only strengthen U.S. business in Bolivia. Uh, and by weakening the commercial relations between Bolivia and its neighbors, it also sought to reestablish the U.S. as the center hub of the hemisphere's commercial relations. Uh, it would be the recipient of Latin America's, South America's raw materials, um, and it would in turn export manufactured goods back to them. The extension of USAID, however, was contingent on the country first offering compensation to Standard Oil. The day after Bolivia paid the company $1.7 million, the Export-Import Bank extended $25 million in development loans for projects cleared by Bowen, specifically the road to Santa Cruz. Um, and these projects had to be undertaken by a mixed U.S.-Bolivian development corporation. In the context of World War II, the State Department wanted first and foremost to maintain access to Bolivian tin. But U.S. officials determined that the road supported that overall goal. With Bolivian labor focused on mining, the threat of food shortage in Bolivia loomed large, especially since the country imported nearly all its food. U.S. officials recognized the need to increase internal sources of food to alleviate food insecurity, increase miner productivity, and reduce potential labor unrest. It was also an opportunity to garner goodwill by making this long-standing Bolivian dream a reality. So it seemed as though U.S. and Bolivian interests seemed to converge in the lowlands. But from the very get-go, there was one major sticking point. The State Department simply refused to support the Cochabamba Santa Cruz Railway, opting instead for a highway. The debate over highway versus railway encapsulated differences in each country's vision for development, 
um, and the Bolivian concerns that partnering with the US would not bring change desired. In his wonderful piece, Imperial Mechanics, historians Ricardo Sal Salvatore argued that in order to expand commercial relations in places like South America, where military invasion and territorial annexation was simply not viable, machines represented and evangelized the notion of US superiority. For Salvatore, the railroad, the automobile, and the airplane all represented different moments in the evolution of US technology. And while the railroad exemplified progress during the 19th century, this was not so by the 1940s. Indeed, the vision of Pan America connected by rail had long been replaced with the vision of a Pan American highway as early as the 1920s. But that the automobile was the most modern of technologies was not in and of itself a sufficiently compelling argument. For Bolivian nationalists, there was a sense that the country could not simply skip ahead. They had to follow the well-trod stages of development. Just as the US frontier had been conquered by the Iron Horse, so too must the Bolivian frontier. That is, if the country ever aspire to industrialization, unification, and the creation of a strong middle class. U.S. officials thought their case was fairly straightforward and should be readily accepted. First and foremost, it was a question of cost. U.S. Army engineers had estimated the railway to cost $29 million as compared to a $7 million, $7 million for a highway. Um, and second, highway construction would require less labor, which meant less of a pull from the mines. Third, the materials needed for railway, specifically steel, would, would have been nearly impossible to obtain during the war. But Bolivian newspapers cried that the country's railroad aspirations were being made a mockery. Victor Paz Estensoro, the future president and leader of Bolivia's 1952 revolution, claimed that the highway would be tantamount to quote, turning over the last bit of our sovereignty. As he warned, quote, we cannot permit others to come here to enslave us in the name of technical aid or civilization. Early criticism indicated that many Bolivians simply refused to regard US aid as an act of generosity. Rather, they saw it as the just compensation for providing Bolivian tin at sacrifice wages. For many, the highway underlined that U.S. interests were simply incompatible with Bolivia's. First, the highway seemed wholly out of sorts with Bolivian reality. Across the entire country, there were approximately 4,000 automobiles. The very first automobile did not arrive in Santa Cruz until 1924. And in 1936, there were only 40 motorized vehicles registered in the department although that number was on the rise. Uh, and these photos uh, on the slide, you can think of as something of a Bolivian reality and experience of automobiles in the lowlands versus a US promoted uh, vision of what automobiles could do for the country. Um, a vision of steeped in post-war consumerism, the dream of suburban nuclear families, but such ads show a mistaken belief that this would have had the same appeal and resonance anywhere, that these desires would resonate across borders. Um, and here, they only reinforced the wide gulf between Bolivian and US societies um, and their interests. For many Bolivians at the time, automobiles were a luxury item, not an adequate tool for development. They were technologies of exclusion not technologies that would foster national integration. The benefits of the highway seemed more readily to accrue to the US auto industry um, than to accrue to the Bolivian society. Ads like this fundamentally misunderstood Bolivian resource nationalism and would only have deepened longstanding misgivings and apprehension about US interests. Rumors had it that the highway was part of a strategic U.S. effort to retake control of Bolivia's petroleum, bringing it back firmly into a U.S. sphere of influence. As the highway um, also tied Bolivia to the U.S. auto industry. 
Bolivians came to see the US-backed highway as a Trojan horse that had the covert purpose of tethering the Bolivian economy to the United States, transforming the country into a captive market for US goods. US officials describe Bolivians as impractical, incapable of sound judgment, especially when it came to governance and finances. And Bolivians' steadfast support for the railway was taken as proof of their anti-progressive and irrational tendencies. Bolivian insistence on a railway, as one letter from the US Embassy read, quote, shows a certain perversity and inferiority complex in them, especially as it pertains to the advice of experienced foreign engineers. The US response was pure arrogance. But the truth was, this was never really up for debate. The US was never going to fund a railway so the Bolivian Congress ultimately approved it, hoping that the railway would just be a dream momentarily postponed. In fact, the highway was, in the words of John Hillman, often treated as an American project from which Bolivia would benefit, rather than primarily as a Bolivian one with American assistance. From the very beginning, there was very little Bolivian buy-in. And US arrogance routinely proved the Bolivian point. The highway would make no use of Bolivia's accumulated railway expertise. The project would depend on US technical advisors, US contractors, and US manufactured machinery. Many Bolivians warned that the highway was transforming the country into a quote, Yankee colony. As one editorial noted, Bolivians would surely become the quote, servile, immoral, and poverty stricken menials of North America. U.S. officials had hoped that the highway would serve as a demonstration project, a showcase for U.S. technical superiority, and thus bring together goals of foreign policy and the business objectives. But throughout the entirety of the highway's construction from 1943 to 54, the highway was a constant black mark on U.S. expertise. In the first 12 months, six kilometers were constructed. By 1947, only 15% had been complete. And the asphalt at that point was already beginning to crack. A complex administrative structure, technical U.S. incompetence, tensions between U.S. and Bolivian personnel were some of the many reasons for this failure. But the more money that the U.S. sunk into the highway, the more the U.S. felt beholden to obtaining success in Santa Cruz. It was simply the logic of sunk costs. And by the time the highway was finally complete in 1954, the total cost for the highway had come in at $50 million. That's well over five times the original estimate and nearly twice the original estimate for the railway. Of course, we'll never know what the real cost of the railway would have been. It was a project um, that would never see completion. So what's the legacy and how do we measure success? As a show of technical, US technical expertise, it failed. It was abundantly clear that the US simply did not understand the Bolivian landscape and political culture. The highway was not a one size fits all endeavor, but it increased commerce. It brought more people to the region. It drastically increased, increased the number of motorized vehicles in the department, as well as vehicular accidents. In fact, the entire city of Santa Cruz de la Sierra would be redesigned with the automobile in mind. Uh, if you look at the map, in lieu of the prior grid of the colonial city, you now see how the city has been designed to have concentric circles um, that would increase the flow of traffic. The road also compelled the U.S. to invest more in the department's petroleum and agriculture sectors. In fact, it was this uneven flow of resources to Santa Cruz that would serve to reinforce a narrative of Cruceño's superiority that their department really would be the future and that they were the most deserving of such aid. After the revolution in 52, both the US and Bolivian governments routinely treated Santa Cruz differently, specifically as a way to diminish some of the more radical actions in the highlands, such as tin, the mine nationalizations um, and the expropriation of private land holdings. The decree for land reform, for example, explicitly protected large-scale land holdings in Santa Cruz, so long as they were capital intensive. Meanwhile, US advisors helped rewrite the petroleum code in the mid-50s so that private companies could return Santa Cruz, rolling back 
the momentous 1937 nationalization. Bolivian aspirations of the 30s and 40s, the development in Santa Cruz would lead to national unity and resource sovereignty did not come to fruition. Instead, uneven development exacerbated and entrenched a regionalism with strong racial undercurrents, a regionalism that continues to shape Bolivian politics up till this very day. All right, thank you, Mira, for a wonderful talk, very insightful talk. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It was wonderful to be able to present uh, this material and to include many um, resources that I actually was able to get during my time at Linda Hall. Well, I was going to ask about that. I saw some of the, the citations for Linda Hall Library material and um, how much Bolivian stuff is in our collection, would you say? So, you know, what I found at Linda Hall Library was that you that the library has an incredible amount of resources um, for Latin Americanists. And a lot of that has um, perhaps more to do for the region as a whole. Um, but for me, and, and one of the reasons I had first applied to, um, to the fellowship was because of um, resources such as the Revista Militar, which was a Bolivian publication of the Bolivian army. Um, and that publication, you guys have a fantastic run of it. Um, and it's something that is not necessarily accessible in its entirety in archives in Bolivia. Um, so I could do things at Linda Hall Library that I was not necessarily <laughs> as easily able to do um, in my research in Bolivia. Uh, so that was fantastic. Uh, I also made use of a number of other journals, including Railway Age, um, and also what you saw most up here was uh, Petróleo Interamericano, which was a journal um, published out of the U.S., but geared towards um, the Latin American um, Petroleum Societies. I was going to ask where that was published. I, yeah, I was I curious whether it was a U.S. journal or... Yes, um, from South America. U.S. but published in Spanish uh, and geared towards this sort of um, elite uh, of petroleum um, engineers from Latin America. How much is petroleum uh, an exported resource from Bolivia today? Do you know? So natural gas um, is natural really gas. is really what um, has has held up the mass government and has been the backbone of their economic growth. One of the primary reasons, mass has a lot to speak for itself, um, but a lot of its visions of change and transformation were made possible because of natural gas. Um, so it has been immensely important for the, the country today. I especially liked how you uh, drew the parallel to the US Transcontinental Railroad. Yes. With the vision for the railroad in Bolivia. I, before you mentioned it, um, I wrote down the Transcontinental Railroad. I, I was going to ask you about that. And then you, and then you talked quite a bit about it, but it just, it, it has so many similarities, the expanding the frontier in search of the resources, um, this expanding the sovereignty across, across the country. And you know, um, it's, I find it fascinating because U.S. officials who were active in Bolivia couldn't help but see um, the U.S. frontier in Bolivia in the Eastern Lowlands. Uh, and I think it's one of the reasons that the Eastern Lowlands held out so much promise to them, why they were willing to um, put so much of their investment behind it, um, because they saw it as how the country could diversify its economy, um, how national unity would be acquired. Um, they saw, and they, and they talked about it as such, um, as the frontier. Uh, and they, you know, those parallels, um, I think, are really, really rich. Um, and it is interesting, too, because uh, Bolivians looked to the United States, looked to what they had done with, with, their, with the U.S. frontier as, as a model that they had to follow. Um, that there were stages of development, um, that if a country was to succeed and progress like the United States had, um, then 
they had to do the things that the U.S. had done out in the U.S. West. And they wanted to do it in Bolivia as well. And as you pointed out, by the 1940s and 50s, the U.S. had transitioned to a highway-dominated transportation system. And it was, um, I think it was 1957 when the interstate highway system began development. But, you know, certainly um, highways, as you know, in the U.S. have become the dominant system uh, as, opposed to, as opposed to railways. It's, it, in Bolivia today, are, is, uh, do they have an extensive railway network? You know, um, or is it highways like here? So it's mostly the railway network has not expanded much since this era that we're, we're discussing today. Um, both the railways from Argentina um, and from Brazil were complete in the 19, um, in 1950, 1955, in the case of Brazil, a little bit after in Argentina. Um, but <laughs> especially in the case of Brazil, that railway is really not that profitable. Um, by the time that it was up and running, there was already a highway that would paralleled it um, and sort of overtook it in importance. Um, so highways, yes, they've, they have more uh, dominated the landscape um, in, in recent history in Bolivia. You mentioned natural gas as, as an important resource. Is that uh, still government controlled or is it private it's, is there private industry in there as well it's a really interesting question um, Abel Morales he they nationalized mass nationalized oil is what they said um, in the 2000s um, however it really wasn't nationalization it was a rewriting of um, the relationship between private um, and, gov and the government um, in the government's favor to be able to get more of that wealth um, from what was being produced within Bolivia. Um, so, you know, saying that they nationalized their petroleum um, more recently under MAS is not actually fully true, uh, but it is certainly something that the government has leaned on and they got a better um, deal out of, out of the bargain. And they just, uh, the party was reelected, right? Uh, it, uh, so there's, uh, astounding. there'll be more to the story. This is a huge to be continued. Um, I, you know, the, the polling was suggesting that Moss was ahead, um, but I don't think anyone expected quite this landslide of a victory. Um, last I checked, they were only at 30% of the official um, votes had been oh. counted. Uh, but even so, we're talking 20 point margin um, in a, in a a uh, system that is new, not a two-party system like the United States. There were uh, several contenders, three primary contenders. So Moss is walking away at this point with over 50% of the vote. Um, and that, that counts. Huge. It's huge. It's huge. And, um, you know, there's a lot at play there. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things that was most surprising today was there was expectations of a lot of... Um, foul play, there was expectations that people would not respect whatever the outcome was. Um, and what we're seeing is that almost all of the contenders for their office have accepted um, the results. The interim government, the right-wing inter interim government of Añez also has accepted it. The US government has accepted the results. It looks like we're going to have a peaceful transition of power. Um, and that's truly fantastic news. That is good news. All right. Well, thank you, Mara, for just a wonderful presentation. And it's, uh, it's always interesting to hear what our research fellows have, have found in our collection and how they have applied uh, what they've learned at the library into their research. So that was, that was very fascinating. Well, thank you so much. Again, it was an honor to be asked back. Um, and it's an honor to be part of this larger community. Mm -hmm.